right, so now we'll turn to our scripture for today. Our scripture for today is found in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days? He said to them, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you dull mind, your dull minds keep you from believing all that the prophets had talked about. Wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then he interpreted for them all the things written about himself in the scriptures, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets. When they came to Emmaus, he acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. After he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us on the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? They got up right then and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their other companions gathered together. They were saying to each other, the Lord really has risen. He appeared to Simon. And then the two disciples describe what happened to them along the road and how Jesus was made known to them as he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We ask that, um, God, you would be present this morning in the words that I speak. May it be your words that we hear. May it be your words that we come to understand. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So what do you want? I don't know. I'm not really sure. I mean, what do you think? What, what do you think? Does that sound like a familiar conversation anyone's ever had before? Ever had a conversation like that? Maybe when it comes to choosing a movie or choosing what TV show to watch or what to order for takeout. I mean, what do you want? Do you want pizza? Do you want burgers? Do you want Mexican? Do you want Chinese? I don't know. I'm not sure. What do you think? Well, you can almost picture Jesus' followers huddled in this room having that type of a conversation. Not about what to eat or about what to watch, but they were having that similar kind of conversation. See, this was Easter afternoon, just hours after Jesus had rose from the dead. And the confusion of that morning was still in the air, and it was leaving them unsure. Unsure of what to do or what to think. Jesus is dead, some of the disciples say. No, Jesus is alive, some of the other ones say. And they say the women, they returned from the tomb, and they said that they saw this angel and that they'd seen Jesus. Peter and John say the tomb was empty. Then you hear two of Jesus' followers say, we're leaving. And they walk out the door, and they head toward a village called Emmaus. This is where we pick up the story for today. They begin this walk they begin this long walk, about seven miles long. It gave them time to reflect. It gave them time to discuss, time to grieve, time to question. Likely, likely that seven-mile walk was probably a good couple hours. 
for them together to process what had been going on. It was quite a walk, quite a walk. And it's one that I think we can connect with as well. So let's begin. Let's begin this journey with Cleopas and his traveling companion, who some commentators suggest is his wife. So let's say it's Cleopas and his wife. And they think that in part because of the hospitality that they would jointly offer to this traveler along the way. And the story, though, does not tell us. It doesn't tell us why the travelers were going to Emmaus. Although the hospitality that they would offer to Jesus, this invitation to stay with them, makes it likely that Emmaus was their home. So they're on this road traveling to Emmaus, and we know very little about Emmaus. We do know, however, that it was about 60 stadia from Jerusalem. A stadium is 607 feet, so 60 stadia would be just short of seven miles. Now Cleopas and his companion began walking. They began walking away from Jerusalem, but the events that had happened, those events didn't leave them. They may have left Jerusalem, but those events were still with them. They could not keep themselves from talking about all the events of that week. There was Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday where Jesus rode into Jerusalem to the praise of the crowds, and then the teaching of Jesus to the crowds at the temple. And then there was the arrest, the arrest by the Jewish leaders and his execution by crucifixion. And then there were these women that came that morning that said that an angel told them that Jesus was alive and that they saw him. It was so much. It was so much to try to understand, so much to try to believe. Maybe, maybe getting out of the city, getting away from it all to help clear their minds, clear their thoughts, and calm their hearts. Maybe that's what they needed. Little did they know, however, how important this walk was going to be for them. Now, I have a question for you. Have you ever been looking for something around your house? Say you're looking for your keys, or say you're looking for your glasses, and you're looking all over. You're looking everywhere, turning everything upside down. This frantic search, right? Only to find that your keys were right in your hand the whole time, or those glasses were on your face. We have quite the ability, I think, quite the ability to miss the obvious sometimes. So Cleopas and his companion, they're walking this road to Emmaus, when suddenly this man starts walking alongside them. His identity has been hidden from them. Listening to their conversation, he asks, what are you guys talking about? Now, this seemingly ridiculous question by Jesus stops Cleopas in his tracks. And he says, are you the only one? Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that had happened these last days? You can imagine his thoughts. You can imagine the thoughts of, where did this guy come from? Did he just crawl out of a hole in the ground? Or was he uh, crawling out from under a rock? How could he not know what had just happened? Now, at first, it might seem like Jesus was sort of messing with these disciples when he asked them, well, what things? But surely it was more than that. His question forced them. It forced them to think about all that they had seen, all that they had learned, all that they had heard, and all that they had believed. See, Jesus had not just died like an hour or two before this conversation. Jesus had now been dead for three days. They thought, they thought there was no way, there was no way that Jesus could be who they thought him to be. And what only added to their confusion was that some of the women said that Jesus was alive and that the tomb was empty. It was all so confusing, so hard to believe, so difficult for them to understand. Have you ever been there? I think we know that feeling sometimes better than we'd like to admit. Sometimes we struggle. We struggle with the question of why. We struggle with that question of why. Why would God allow this to happen to me or to someone that I care about? Why doesn't God do something to take away this pain? You look at life and those around you and see all that they're going through, and it is so confusing. 
So what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do with his disciples who were concerned and who were confused and who were struggling? Listen to Jesus' words. He says, how foolish you are. How slow to believe that all the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter in his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them all that was in the scriptures concerning himself. So where did Jesus take these confused disciples? He takes them to a place that is available for us today as well. He takes them to the word of God. He points them. He points them to the word. The word points to Jesus, and they tell, the word tells us about our sins and our need for Jesus and a coming Savior. There are so many passages that even prefigure Christ that tell us about him without telling us exactly. The opening chapters of Genesis talk about the descendant of Eve who's going to crush the serpent. Noah's Ark shows us what God's judgment is like against sin, and we need rescue that only he can provide. Abraham shows us the type of faith that we need to have in God and in his promises. Abraham's son Isaac carries firewood up a mountain so that he could be a sacrifice just like Christ carries the cross. Joseph, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. Jesus was betrayed by his disciples. Moses was almost killed by an evil king at his birth. So was Jesus. The whole sacrificial system points to the need for a lasting sacrifice. Now that list, that list goes on and on. It goes on in the ways that we can um, look at Scripture and see how Scripture points to Jesus. He is the fulfillment of it. So what is the application here? What's our takeaway? When you can't see Jesus, look to the Scriptures. Look to God's Word. When you can't see what Jesus is doing in your life, or you can't hear him speaking to you, Look to God's word. Go to the Bible. See him there and hear him there. Now, once, once they understand how Scripture points to the Messiah needing to suffer and to die and to rise again, it changes everything for them. They believe. I mean, of course. Of course the descendant of Eve would be struck by the serpent. And of course it was the Father's will to crush him for our sins. And yes, of course Jesus is the final sacrificial lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Of course the resurrection happened because that was God's plan. When you can't see Jesus, look to the scriptures. But for them it all happened so fast. It happened so quickly and confusion begins to set in and questions come again. Really? Really did all of this just happen? Did all of this happen just so quickly? The arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, the strange testimonies of Jesus' resurrection, it all came so fast. So much confusion, so many questions. Then, then there are these moments of clarity, followed yet again by more confusion. It's as if a fog rolls in, our vision gets cloudy, our clarity is difficult. Now, speaking of fog, did you know that according to the Bureau of Standards in Washington, a dense fog covering seven city blocks to a depth of 100 feet is composed of less than one glass of water? That amount of water is divided up into about 60 billion tiny droplets. Yet, when those minute tiny droplets, when those settle over a city or settle over a countryside, they can almost blot out everything from your sight. The disciples, specifically Cleopas and his companion in this passage, find themselves in a fog. And I think many of us find ourselves in a fog at times as well. When we allow a cup, a cup of trouble, a cup of anxiety, of strain, of turmoil, of defeat, when we allow that cup, take over. When we allow it to take over our thoughts, that's when that fog rolls in. We all have those days. We all have those days when we're praying and we're waiting and we're working towards something 
yet we're met with discouragement. We take our eyes off Jesus, and when we do that, that fog of doubt and worry rolls in. That fog of doubt and worry starts to surround us. That fog comes in when we take our eyes off of Jesus. Have you ever had a moment of confusion? I mean, like, really confused where you didn't know which end was up or what was happening or what was going on? I think we all have at one point or another. None of us are immune from that. So what do you do? What do you do in those times of confusion or in those times when there's that fog around you? I've seen some people during that time just completely shut down, just completely shut down. I've also seen other people go into that, I'm going to figure this out clarity mode where they start seeking all of the answers. And then in that seeking for all the answers, they get lost. They get lost in that search. I've also seen some that just start laughing, and they start acting as if this is all a dream, this isn't really happening, and denial becomes their coping mechanism. Do you think the followers of Jesus employed any of these? They definitely faced confusing challenges. Eventually, eventually confusion gave way to clarity. And even the good news of the resurrection caused confusion for a little while, as we've seen in this passage. However, the issue really is not that of confusion. The issue is that of our response. In this passage, we see confusion appear. And we see how God approaches and teaches and leads his followers through that fog. You see, Christ not only joined Cleopas and his companion on the road, he joins us on our roads as well. He walks with us. When it seems like everything in the world is going wrong, he walks with us. And he reminds us. He reminds us of the story of our salvation, the story of how God came to be with us, and how God will be with us through it all. As we journey with Christ on this road to Emmaus, we can't help but be changed. So what is it? What is it? that triggers our recognition? What is it that triggers our recognition in us, here and now? What is it that makes us aware of Christ's presence in this place, or Christ's presence in our lives? It doesn't need to be anything fancy. It doesn't need to be anything complicated. Maybe it's a prayer. Maybe it's a familiar favorite Bible verse. Maybe it's singing one of those old familiar hymns. Or maybe it's seeing an ordinary loaf of bread and a pitcher of grape juice on a table. It wasn't the breaking of the bread that Cleopas and his companions' eyes were opened. Scripture tells us that they recognized him. They recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, weren't our hearts on fire when he spoke to us along the road and when he explained the scriptures for us? Our hearts burn within us as we encounter Jesus. And we discover the hope. We discover the hope of new life. How can we not go? How can we not go and share? Share that good news with others. That walk to Emmaus, that was just the beginning. That was just the beginning of a journey. It was not an end. Don't you see? As we walk that road... As we journey with Jesus and we share, we share in that journey with others. So like the two on the road to Emmaus, we do not travel alone. God is with you. God is with me. Are we willing to see? Are we willing to recognize Christ in our lives? Let us pray. God, we ask that you would open our eyes to you, that you would help us to see you along the way as we journey this life of faith with you. Open our eyes. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.